Hello, friends. I'm Frankie. Welcome to the Think Tank. So I don't know if you guys are like me, but I haven't really been following this Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell case and all the mayhem and death that they have left behind. So what I thought I would do is go through Lori's probable cause with you. I've skimmed through it and I've learned a lot about the case and how horrific it actually is. So I thought maybe we would go through this together. And those of you that already are totally aware, this might refresh you a little bit. As we know, Lori's side of the case is coming up here. And so yeah, maybe a fast refresher on what actually has been going on with this case. I was literally startled, like the different rabbit holes a person can go down, unreal. So it is going to take me a little while to kind of get my footing as far as this case goes. I've been studying it for the past few days pretty intensely. So yeah. Let's see how this goes. I hope you guys enjoy it and get um, caught up or refreshed. So this here is a probable cause. And this is from back in June 29th, 2020. So it's been a while. So we've got uh, the state of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vello, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell. So I didn't realize this, but Chad is her fifth husband. Okay, here we go. So I, Lieutenant Ron Ball of the Rexburg Police Department being fully do sworn under oath, depose and state as follows. So one, the information contained herein is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. I am a detective with the Rexburg Police Department and have employed in law enforcement for more than 27 years. I'm currently the Lieutenant over investigations for the Rexburg Police Department. I currently hold an advanced certificate in management uh, and a management certificate from the Idaho Peace Officer Standard and Training Academy. So this whole page must have been redacted. Not sure why. And I have over 2,500 hours of training. I've attended multiple training and classes throughout my career, including graduating from the FBI National Academy in 2015. I've received multiple hours of specialized training in investigations. I've also conducted numerous investigations and interviews with suspects, victims, witnesses involving narcotics, SEX crimes, and fraud. I have also received numerous hours of training on traffic stops and detention of criminal, sorry, detection of criminal behavior. So three, since November 26, 2019, the Rexburg Police Department has been involved in the search for JJ Vallows. So I am going to just put up this. So this is JJ and uh, Kylie, Tylee. Do, 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 do. Okay, let's see where I was. So JJ Vallow, date of birth, May 25th, 2012. And Tylee Ryan, date of birth, September 24th, 2002. The search for these children began when Kay Woodstock, sorry, Woodcock, JJ's grandmother, called Gilbert, Arizona Police to report that she had not had any contact with JJ for several months. 
Gilbert police contacted Detective Ray, okay, Hermosillo of the Rexburg Police Department, RPD, and due to RPD helping the Gilbert police with an investigation in which JJ and Tylee's mother, cousin, and uncle were all persons of interest. How demented is that? Okay, here. Tylee? Uh, uh, Jay, JJ and Tylee's mother, Vallo, has been charged with two felony counts of desertion of a mild, minor child, one misdemeanor count of resisting and obstructing, one misdemeanor count of solicitation to commit a crime, and one misdemeanor count of contempt. The contempt charge is for failing to comply with an order in a child protection action in Madison County to produce JJ and Kylie to the Rexburg Police Department or the Department of Health and Welfare. Velo was required to produce the children by January 30th, 2020, and she refused to do so. Well, that's not suspicious at all, is it? There we go. Tylee, 16 years old at the time, went missing, and JJ was seven years old when he went missing. Until this time, law enforcement has stated that Tylee, 17 at the time she went missing, because we are not aware when she was missing until several months after her 17th birthday. However, there is reason to believe she was unalived before her 17th birthday. Okay, so Chad Daybell. Let's see if I've got a picture of him. Isn't that something? For some reason I don't. Probably because he's ugly as mud. There we go. Daybell and Vallo were married on November 5th, 2019. Chad Daybell was present in Kauai, Hawaii on February 20th, 2020, when Vallo was arrested on the felony desertion charges. I was present Present at the arrest, Daybell was also present at Velo's March 6th initial, additional, uh, initial appearance in Madison County. As such, I know Daybell was aware of felony charges directly related to the location, health, and well-being of the children above. The last verifiable sighting of Tylee was on September 8, 2019 in Yellowstone National Park. The last verifiable sighting of JJ was September 22, 2019 in his mother's apartment located at 565 Pioneer Road, number 175, Rexburg, Idaho by Lori's friend, Melanie Gibb, and David Warwick. Meanwhile, the Rexburg police and FBI have received many tips of alleged sightings since the beginning of this case. None of these tips have led to any verifiable or actionable information regarding the health, safety, or location of the minor children. Vella moved to Rexburg on or about September 1st, 2019 with Tylee and JJ and her brother, Alex Cox. That is Alex and that is Lori's ex-husband that um, we'll learn a little bit about here to come. 
on November 26, 2019, Detective Hermosa, sorry, I think it's Hermosillo, and Detective Hope went to Vallow's home and located at 565 Pioneer Road to conduct a welfare check. Detective Hermosilla, Hermosillo <laughs> and Hope met with Cox. So that is Alex Cox, the brother, and Daybell outside the residence. Daybell acted as if he didn't know Velo very well. Well, there you go. And stated he didn't know her phone number. Let's see here. So it is saying that when Velo moved to Rexford on or about September 1st, 2019 with Taylor and JJ and her brother, Alex Cox, Velo resided with her children in unit 175. So Alex Cox resided in the same complex, different unit. So to, do, to conduct a welfare check, Daybell acted like he didn't know Velo very well. And Cox told the detective that JJ was with his grandma, Kay Woodcock, in Louisiana, which was not very likely due to the fact that it was Kay that called in the missing child report. Cox and Vello might be in apartment 107, he told the cops. Hermosillo and Hope went to apartment 107, but the apartment was completely empty and vacant. At this time, they called me and Detective David Stubbs and asked me to come to do a premises, come to the premises to help search for JJ. There is an awful lot of uh, not good going around these people. On the same day, myself and Detective Stubb located and spoke with Velo in her apartment 175. We identified ourselves and Velo told us that JJ was in Gilbert, Arizona with a friend named Melanie Gibb. Let me see if I've got a picture of Melanie Gibb for us. No, doesn't look like it. Oh, yeah, I do. So this is Melanie and Lori. So we obtained Gibbs' phone number from Velo. This encounter was recorded on body cam. We ended our contact with Velo and immediately attempted to call Gibb. We were unable to contact or speak with her at the time. Velo also informed RPD that Tylee was attending BYU, Idaho, and living with Velo. Because Detective Stubbs and I were unable to contact Gibb, we immediately contacted Velo again, and we requested that she call Gibb. At this time, Velo told us that Gibb and JJ were at the movie Frozen 2, so it was unlikely Gibb would answer the phone. We instructed Velo to call Gibb and give get Gibb to contact us so we could verify the location of JJ. By the evening of November 6, 26, 2019, we had still not heard from Gibb, so our PD informed Detective Ryan Piller of the Gilbert Police Department of the information we had received regarding the children being with Gibb. Detective Hermosillo was informed later around 9.30 p.m. that the Gilbert police went to the home of Gibb. Gibb was not home, but Detective Pillar contacted her by phone and she stated that JJ was not staying at her Arizona, Arizona house and had not been there for several months. On December 6th, 2019, Detective Hermosillo was contacted by Gibb. She informed us that both Daybell and Velo called Gibb on the 26th of 
November 2019 at separate times. She was contacted first by Daybell, who told her that she would probably be contacted by the police in regards to JJ's location. And he then asked her to not answer the call. So Gibb informed the RPD that she was confused by this request because she had only been told by Vallo in late September or in early October that JJ was living with Kay Woodcock, who's JJ's grandmother. Gibb asked Daybell if JJ was living with Kay and he told her that JJ was not with Kay. They can't keep their stories straight for anything, can they? Gibb was soon thereafter contacted by Velo on her phone. Velo asked Gibb to tell the police that she had JJ and asked Gibb to tell the police that she had taken JJ to the movie Frozen 2. Velo also asked Gibb to take a picture of some of the children in a manner that it would make it appear that Gibb had JJ with her and to send that picture to the police. Gibb informed Velo that she would not lie to the police and Gibb did not comply with Velo's request. Number 17, Gibb first met Velo. So here, where were we? In early 2019, Gibb was presented with Velo during a telephone conversation between Velo and Daybell. This conversation was in response to a vision of Velo that her husband, Charles Velo, and her son, JJ. Hold on here. Busy sidewalk today. She's got to bark at everybody. So if I cut out for two seconds, it's because I'm trying to make this just flow. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh my God. Okay, some peace. <laughs> Jib, oh sorry, Jib. Gib was informed, law enforcement, that the word zombie was introduced to her weeks after the initial conversation to describe an individual whose spirit has left their body and has been replaced by another spirit. The new spirit inhabiting a person or a zombie's body was always a dark spirit. So some pretty crazy conversations going around in early 2019. Vallow said that her husband, Charles, and her son, JJ, were both going to die in a car accident on January 1st or 2nd of 2029. Sorry, 2019, which did not happen. During and after the conversation, Vallow told Gibb that Daybell had informed her that while Charles had not physically died in the accident, his spirit had left his body and had been replaced with another spirit which was a dark spirit that they called Ned Snyder. Wow. This is uh, Lori and her ex-husband, Charles. So 19, Gibb was informed law enforcement that the word zombie was introduced into the conversation at that time. 20, at some point, Gibb first learned this doctrine from Velo and Daybell. She was informed by Velo and Daybell that they believed it was their mission to rid the world of zombies. When Velo initially spoke to Gibb about getting rid of zombies, she spoke about saying prayers to remove dark spirits from the bodies and they had that they had inhabited. 
this information had been corroborated by electronic communications. Good Lord, Bob Vallow and Daybell. Oh my goodness. Doesn't it just really want make you wonder sometimes how people's minds get to a certain point? Let's see here. That for you guys. So 22, Melanie Gibb had further informed RPD that sometimes in sometime in the spring of 2019, before the death of Charles Vallow, that Lori Vallow called Tylee a zombie. Gibb was on the phone with Lori and heard Lori call Tylee a zombie, to which Tylee responded, not me, mom. Upon the unsealing of the probable cause affidavit in State versus Daybell, Gibb spoke with me and clarified that Lori herself told Gibb that Tylee responded to being a zombie by saying, not me, mom. Gibb did not hear Tylee say these words herself. This arose out of Lori requiring Tylee to babysit JJ, and Tylee did not want to. Lori Vello also told Gibb that Tylee had turned into a zombie when she was 12 or 13 years old, which is about the same time that Tylee became difficult to deal with as any teenager well, does. Number 23, Gibb has further informed me that she was told by Daybell and Velo that they had the religious belief that they were part of the Church of the Firstborn and their mission in this church was to lead the 144,000 mentioned in the book of Revelation. 24, on January 26, 2020, a search warrant was served on Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow in Kauai, Hawaii, where they were living. Oh, oh, where they were living and on their vehicle. The children were not found with Chad and Lori in Hawaii, but no evidence was suggested that they were living with Chad and Lori. 25. Through the investigation, we have discovered that J.J. Vallo was registered at the Kennedy Elementary School in Rexburg the first week of September 2019. Kennedy School was informed that J.J. had an individual education plan due to his autism. Kennedy Elementary was in the process of creating a new IEP for J.J. On September 23rd, 2019, JJ had an unexcused absent. It should be noted that originally in our investigation, we believed JJ was in school September 23rd, but upon reviewing his school records, we found that he had not had the unexcused absence, that he was not and had an unex unexcused absence. On September 24th, 2020, Lori Vallow called Vicki Barton at the Madison School District and informed her that JJ was going to Louisiana with his grandparents and wouldn't be home until the end of October or May. October or maybe later, not May. On October 29th, Madison School District records indicate that JJ would not be sorry, that JJ would be homeschooled. During the searches of Vallow's apartment in Rexburg and subsequent searches of her apartment in Kauai, no, no homeschooling materials were ever found. Unreal. I, you know, how do these kids just disappear like this? I understand that a lot of people didn't have to be accountable when COVID was going through us heavily, but so many kids went missing. It blows me away. All different ages, all different sizes, all. It was just used as an excuse for people, in my opinion, to not do their jobs properly. 26, as mentioned, the last ver verifiable sighting of Tylee was 
in Yellowstone National Park on September 8th, 2019. Photographs established she was there with her mother, Lori Vallo, her brother, JJ Vallo, and her uncle, Alex Cox. Uncle Alex. The cellular, this is 27, the cellular analysis survey team is an FBI unit um, abbreviated to CAST, C-A-S-T, and they provide analysis of cell phone records and presents the information to law enforcement. CAST has analyzed Alex Cox's phone and provided the location information mentioned in paragraph 25. The CAST analysis provides the location of Cox's phone. Due to my training and experience, and common knowledge, I am aware that most individuals now keep their cell phones with them at all times. And the location of an individual's phone can be used to establish the location of the owner of the phone. CAST uses a cellular devices, GPS data points, cell tower connections, Wi-Fi connections, and Google tracking information to establish the location of a cell phone. The GPS data points Used, the, used by CAST are considered to be highly accurate and can place an individual within a six meter radius. CAST has further informed law enforcement that Cox's phone exited the west entrance of Yellowstone National Park at 6.40 p.m. His phone appeared to be at Buckaroo's Barbecue Grill. <laughs> in West Yellowstone, Montana from 6.45 to 7.09. Cox then returned to Rexburg, Rexburg, Madison County, Idaho at approximately 10.37. The phone was then at Lori's apartment number until 21.35 at which time Cox appeared to go to the Maverick on Main Street and Rexburg 2143 until 2153. Cox then went back to Lori's apartment from 2244 to 2315. At 2344, Cox's phone is located at his residence. 29, on Monday, September 9th from 12 a.m., until quarter to one, Cox's phone was located as apartment. However, at 2.42 a.m. until 3.37 a.m., Cox is located again at Vallow's apartment where Vallow lived with Tylee and JJ. This is significant not only because he is there in the middle of the night, but also because this is the only time in September he appears to go over to Vallow's apartment between midnight and 6 a.m. Number 30, there is, it's fairly long, isn't it, guys? Let's see here. Let's see if I can. There we are. So Cox's phone is still at Daybell's residence at 10.39 a.m. At 10.47, his phone shows a hit at City of St. Anthony. At this time, we're unable to tell if he was actually inside the city limits of St. Anthony, which is about a five-minute drive from the Daybell residence, or if this was the cell tower ping on his phone while he was still at Daybell's residence. 1057 to 1139, Cox is located at the Daybell property. At 1152 to 1202, he was at Del Taco in Rexburg, which he appears to spend most of the rest of his day in his apartment. 32, through this investigation of the Rexburg Police Department and FBI, have seized, searched, and analyzed multiple cellular devices pursuant to search warrants on June 1st, 2020. I was informed by Special Agent Ricky Wright of the FBI 
and the FBI had been examining a phone believed to be owned by Tamara Tammy Daybell. The FBI found a text conversation between Tammy and Daybell on September 9th, 2019, which is the day after the last known sighting of Tylee in Yellowstone National Park. 33, so this is the text message as followed. A, Daybell to Tammy at 11.53 a.m. Well, I've had an interesting morning. Daybell to Tammy's phone. I felt I should burn all of the limb debris by the fire pit and it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun and he was still walking. He was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. Daybell to Tammy at 11.56. Going to shower, nap, and go right for a while. At BYU. Love you. Tammy to Daybell. Good for you. Daybell to Tammy. I'm back home tomorrow. No, I'm back home now. So 34. I found a text suspicious because raccoons are normally nocturnal animals and are not regularly out during the day. Matt and Reagan Price, Daybell's neighbors, have informed law enforcement that Daybell's son, Garth, told him that Daybell had shot a raccoon sometime between July and August of 2019 during the day. Garth told Matt Price about the raccoon in response to a question from Matt about hearing a gunshot. The Price... The prices informed me that the fire pit in the back of Daybell's pro property was hardly ever used until the last few months. Reagan informed me that there appeared to be frequent bonfires in the pit on the Daybell property over the last few months. And the first one she noticed was soon after Tammy's death on October 19th, 2019. So, that Tammy is um, Chad's now, uh, yeah, Chad's now deceased wife. I don't have many pictures of him. And I'm okay with that. So on June 2nd, 2020, Detective Bruce Mattingly of the Fremont County Sheriff's Office contacted Samantha Gwilliam, who is the sitter, sister of Tammy Daybell. He asked her if she was aware of a pet cemetery on the Daybell's property in Idaho. She informed him that she was aware of the pet cemetery and stated that both she and Tammy were pet people and they had both had pet cemeteries. When asked about the location of the pet cemetery on the property, she stated that it was east of the red barn and near the fire pit. On June 4th, I spoke to Samantha and she informed me that she was aware of the location of the, of the pet cemetery on the Daybell property because Tammy had shown it to her. Samantha was also shown an aerial photograph of the Daybell property and she pointed to the same area pit near where the fire pit, near the fire pit where Alex Cox phone pinged on September 29th. Yeah. Alex. 36. The above facts established that Alex Cox appeared to be at the Daybell property on September 9, 2019, until at least 11.39. Chad sent the text to Tammy about burning debris and shooting the buried and burying the raccoon in the pet cemetery 
only 14 minutes later at 11.53. The Pet Cemetery referenced by Chad Daybell is located at the same location. Most of the pings on Alex's phone was on September 9th, 2019. There's the fire pit. And then you can see the different blue tarps. And you can also see the area that they've been excavating. On June 3rd, 2020, I again interviewed Gib and her boyfriend, David Warwick, in Pleasant Grove, Utah. We discussed in depth the weekend of September 22nd and 23rd, 2019, Due to the fact that both Gibb and Warwick stayed at Lori Vallow's residence in Rexburg that weekend, Gibb informed me, consistent with information she had previously given to law enforcement, that she arrived in Rexburg on September 19, 2019. Soon after she arrived, Lori Vallow informed Gibb that JJ had become a zombie and pointed out behaviors such as sitting still and watching TV, claiming JJ said he loved Satan and increased vocabulary as JJ was now a zombie. Gibb observed JJ's behavior and felt it to be the same as she had always observed it. They just are uh, pretty much coming up with any kind of excuse it seems to me to, I mean, I don't know, is Lori this mentally ill or is she this manipulative? What? There's so many questions about Alex, Chad Daybell. Like there is so much to go over, so much to learn, so many rabbit holes. So Warwick, this is number 39, Warwick further informed us that when he woke up in the morning of September 23rd, 2019, he asked Vallow where JJ was, and this was between 8 and 9 a.m. Vallow informed Warwick and Gibb that JJ had been acting like a zombie and had been crawling around the kitchen cabinetry and had gotten up on top of the cabinetry, count, <laughs> cabinetry, in the space between the cabinets and the ceiling, she informed Warwick that Gib and Gib that when JJ had climbed up on the cabinetry, he had knocked a picture of Jesus off the refrigerator. When Velo then informed Warwick and Gib that Cox had become had come and taken JJ. Let me see this again. Bello then informed Warwick and Gibb that Cox had come and taken JJ. And no time during this interaction with Bello did Gibb or Warwick believe that JJ was in danger. Bello had not said anything about harming JJ or having Cox harm JJ. Unreal. Once again, this is... Cox. Number 40, approximately one week after Gibb's September visit to Rexburg, Vallow informed Gibb that she had arranged for JJ to live with his grandma, Kay Woodcock. Vallow further told Gibb that she had told Kay that she had cancer in order to convince Kay Woodcock to take JJ. Oh, Velo further elaborated to Gib that she had traveled with JJ and handed him off to Kay at the airport. 42. Yes. On June 3rd, 2020, I asked Special Agent Ricky Wright of the FBI to analyze the frequency of Alex Cox's visit to Chad Daybell's property during the month of September in 2019, and his response was, 
Per your request, I checked the visits by Alex to Chad's house again. There were only four visits by Alex during the month of September. These were on September 6th, 1241 to 1253, September 9th, September 23rd, September 25th, 10.05 to 10.22. During the two visits, uh, 9 to 6, sorry, September 6th and September 25th, all pings were in and around the house, and there were no pings anywhere in the backyard near the fire pit or pond. As you can see, these visits were also short, about 11 minutes to 17 minutes, like the one on September 23rd, 17 minutes. This visit was on September 9th and the only long visit approximately two and a half hours. 43, on June 9th, 2020, a search warrant was executed at Daybell's residence and the property with assistance of the local FBI ERT team we located at multiple sites of interest. These sites were identified and corresponded to by cell with the cellular data from Alex Cox's phone was he when he was on the property and uh, mentions paragraph 12 through 16. So this is Alex Cox. His phone is pinging at the daybells. Additionally, one of the possible site correlations to the property chatted text his wife about. The first site of interest was located on the north side of the near pond to the north edge of the property. This site corresponded with the two GPS pings from Alex Cox's phone on September 23rd, 2019. A patch of ground was located that appeared to be disturbed. The weed growth on top of the disturbed ground was shorter than the surrounding weed growth. What appears to be sod Etching was also noticed. The disturbed area was approximately four feet by two and a half feet. 46, members of the FBI ERT team removed the lop, the, the, lop, the top layer of sod. Underneath the layer of sod were several large flat rocks. The rocks were removed and two pieces of flat paneling were found. The paneling was removed and investigators exposed a round object covered in black plastic. 47, upon exposing the ground, upon exposing the round object covered in black plastic and a strong odor was noticed. An FBI ERT member used a small, sharp instrument, made a small incision in the plastic, and a layer of white plastic was observed. An incision was made into the white layer of plastic, exposing what appeared to be human remains, the crown of the head covered with light brown hair. Oh, my God. Oh. Forty-nine, Cheryl Anderson, associate professor of anthropology at Boise State University, was present on scene and advised the remains found near the pond did appear to be human. Fifty, as noted above, the GPS on Alex Cox's phone pinged twice on September 23rd, 2019, near the first site where human remains were found. The GPS records indicate that Cox was at the location for a total of 17 minutes. <clears throat> Sorry, dry mouth.
Uh, the location for a total of 17 minutes on September 23rd, 2019. Due to the depth and width of the grave the body was located in and the rocks and paneling found in the grave, it would be impossible for anyone to have dug that grave, placed a body in it, placed the rocks and paneling in the grave and cover it back, yet, back up in 17 minutes. Fair enough, fair enough. 51, a second site of interest was located behind a red unattached outbuilding located roughly in the center of the property near the fire pit. Next to the fire pit is an area used as a pet cemetery. This site correlated to several GPS pings of Alex Cox's phone on September 9th, 2019. Dear Uncle Alex. Let me see here. Dear Uncle Alex. A second site of interest was located behind. Okay, we did that. 52 ground in this area was probed with a steel pole and several areas of disturbed ground were located. During a search of this ground, a buried cat and dog were found. No raccoons remained at that location. A backhoe was used to dig further layers of dirt. While doing this, bricks were located approximately a foot down to the ground. 53. Once the bricks were discovered, the soil was examined and what appeared to be two bones were located. Based on the condition of the first bones, Cheryl Anderson was not able to determine if the bones were human. 54, methodically the dirt in this area was searched and several items of interest were found, including other bones, charred tissue and charred bones. Cheryl Anderson indicated these additional bones, both charred and uncharred, and tissue found were all human remains. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Doomsday mother it is. So 55, investigators provided photos of some of the partial remains that were found at the pet cemetery to Dr. Getz, PhD, a forensic anthropologist. Dr. Getz was able to identify those remains as being non-adult human remains. 56, around the time the head mentioned, around the time the head mentioned in paragraphs 44 through 55 were discovered, Chad Daybell were was observed leaving his daughter's residence in a gray SUV. I and other officers pursued him in police vehicles, conducted a traffic stop and detained him due to the fact that humans, human remains were discovered on his property. Such a peach, such a peach. 57, June 11, 2020, I observed the autopsy of the body described in paragraph 44 through 50. The body has not yet been removed from the plastic covering it was found in. As the body was uncovered and the face exposed, it was clear to me that this was the body of J.J. Vallow. The body was well-preserved. While I never met J.J. Vallow during his life, I was familiar with his face due to seeing many pictures and videos of him. I was further familiar with his haircut in the pictures I had seen of him at Yellowstone, which was shaved on both sides and the back and top. Shaved on the sides and back and longer on the top, okay. JJ was further identified by Brandon Brudreau, who was shown an autopsy photograph of the body and face and was able to verify the remains were JJ. 58, 
June 11, 2020. I also observed the autopsy of the human remains described in paragraphs 51 to 55. It was not possible to identify those remains by simply looking at them. They were too damaged by fire and dismemberment and no longer had, oh my God. Oh, no longer had any recognizable features. However, Dr. Glenn Smith, an orthodontist and deputy coroner at the Ada County Coroner's Office, was able to identify these remains as belonging to Tylee Ryan by matching an irregular jawline with an X-ray of Tylee when she was still alive. Despite identifying Tylee, law enforcement was advised that it would still be wise to obtain DNA verification. We were informed that sufficient soft tissue existed, which was not burnt, that we would be able to test the DNA. We are in the process of having, having that tested. So remembering this has all been verified and what have you. This is um, back in 2020. So 59. On January 16, 2020, a Child Protection Acts action was filed by the state of Idaho in Madison County on behalf of JJ and Kylie. The case number is CV33-20-0045. The court ordered Vallow to produce JJ and Tylee within five days of service of the order to the Rexburg Police mm -mm -mm. Department or the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare in Rexburg. Vello was served that order on January 25th, 2020 by Detective Chad Cataluna of the Kauai Police Department. Vello refused to produce the children and never complied with the court order. Of course they didn't. Aye. 60. Alex Cox died December 12, 2019 in Maricopa County, Arizona. His death has been ruled to have been caused by natural causes. 61. Due to the facts listed in this affidavit, probable cause exists that Chad Daybell, Lori Vello, and Alex Cox conspired to commit the crime of concealing and destroying, altering evidence that they knew would be produced, used, or discovered as evidence in a trial proceeding. 62. Chad Daybell performed at least the following overt acts in furtherance of the affirmation conspiracy. A, text Tammy Daybell and told her about burning debris and bring a dead raccoon in the pet cemetery on September 9th, 2019. B, deceptively acted as if he did not know Vallow very well and did not know Vallow's phone number when questioned by the Rexburg police on November 26, 2019, despite the fact that they were married at the time. Oh, how do so many sick people meet each other and then make things sound okay? I, how, how do they explain themselves? <laughs> so 63, Alex Cox performed at least the following overt acts in furtherance of the aforementioned conspiracy. A, told Rexburg police on or about November 26, 2019, that JJ was with his grandma Kay in, in Louisiana. B, transported J.J. Vallo from Madison County, Idaho to Chad Daybell's property in Fremont County on September 23rd, 2019. 64. Lori Vallo performed at least 
the following overt actions in furtherance of the aforementioned conspiracy. A. Telephoned Melanie Gibb and asked her to lie to the police about the location of JJ. B. Asked Gibb to create false evidence of JJ's existence and location. C. Falsely informed the Rexburg police that JJ was in Arizona with Melanie Gibb. D. Falsely informed the Rexburg Police Department that Tylee was attending BYU Idaho and living with Velo. E. Refused to produce the children to the Rexburg Police or the Idaho Department of Welfare as required by a court order. Further, your affidavit, your affiant say, saith not. Further, your affiant saith not. Dated the 29th day of June, 2020. Signed by Ron Bell, Lieutenant from the Rexburg Police Department. Subscribed and sworn in on the 19th day of June, 2020. Notarized. So guys, there's a lot, there's a lot there. You know, I've um, been, like as I was saying, I've been doing some pretty deep dives and I've dug up a lot of paperwork that I would like to go through. I'm not sure if I'm going to be following the trial like I did the last one, but I'll play it by ear. I'll, I'll see how many people are truly, truly interested in watching these cases all day long. It's an awful lot of work and worth doing it if you guys actually want to see it. So guys, may they rest in peace and I hope they get the justice that they have coming. Somebody has to pay for what has happened to these kids. And I think that it's pretty obvious who has done what. So, like I said, the court case is coming up. So we'll get some answers soon. So, guys, thanks for spending the time with me. And I'll absolutely see you in the next one. Bye.